Hi, this is Jeff Heaton. Welcome to Applications of Deep Neural Networks with Washington University. In this module, we're going to look at AIGEM. So AIGEM is a benchmark platform that lets you, in Python, evaluate your reinforcement learning programs against well-known games, Atari games, and other things like that. So we're going to see how you can actually interface into this and use this to even watch the games play on the screen or to train them in an offline way. To see all my videos about Kaggle, neural networks, and other AI topics, click the subscribe button and the bell next to it and select all to be notified of every new video. So let's take a look at OpenAI Gym. So reinforcement learning is what we're dealing with for this module and the next five parts. So reinforcement learning, it's not like supervised learning or unsupervised learning. It is really sometimes referred to as self-supervised. What's going to happen is you're going to give the computer some sort of a game. And it doesn't have to be game. It could be, it's really anything that has well-defined rules and can be completely simulated in the computer. So basically a game. But to use this for other types of learning, you really need to express your problem in such a way so that the rules are well-defined, so that there's kind of an increment as you go through episodes. So each play of the game, so to speak, is an episode. You go through a series of steps. At each step, the computer can take a given action, and then at the end, its performance is evaluated did it succeed or did it not? And at each step, it is given a reward based on how well it did. And the machine plays it over and over and over again, and it's able to learn and get very good at playing this. This was used in Go and chess to develop extraordinarily powerful computers that can play better than the humans who ever taught it how to do this. And it does this basically by playing chess, essentially with itself, because the rules are well well defined, and it gets better and better and better. And what's amazing about it is it needs no prior knowledge of chess. So all those chess books that talk about famous openings and whatnot, it's almost like an alien came from another parallel Earth that developed chess on their own, but the two planets did not share any techniques on chess. So these extremely advanced chess players from the from the parallel world came to Earth to play, and they're playing chess from a whole different rule book. So it, I think that was part of the complexity, too, for, for the Go players as well, to beat these highly optimized machines. So let's see OpenAI Lab. So OpenAI Lab, Jim, is basically a bunch of games, even the Atari games, all set up so that you can have your program compete against them. So this is OpenAI Gen. You can see that they have Atari games. These are running through an Atari emulator. That works really well on Mac and on Linux. On Windows, you can make it work, but there is some complexities to getting the Atari emulator working. On Windows, the classic games, like you see here, that is the pole cart, that's the pendulum, those work just fine. And we'll start off using pole cart and using mountain car, which are some fairly classic games. For example, let me show you what those look like. If you click on the environments, you can see these are the classic control games. The ones that we're going to work on in particular are cart pole and mountain car. There's two versions of mountain car, and this becomes important when we see how to actually interact with these. There is, this is mountain car that basically has a Boolean throttle. Either you've got your foot on the brake all the way down, or you've got your foot on the gas all the way down. The idea of mountain cart, mountain car, is to try to get up here to this flag. The car's engine is simply not powerful enough to do it. It is going to, even if you floor it, so you, we pretty much have to, you've got three controls on this one, forward, backward, and brake. So pushing it up, it's going to get to about here and then just roll back down. It just does not have enough momentum. So what it needs to do is go as fast as it can, roll back, 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 up here, 
push it hard to go up here and then push it hard to go up here and eventually just by rocking back and forth you get enough momentum that you make it up the hill. So it takes a little AI to learn to do that. It's, it's I also show you an algorithm that I write that is just if statements that is able to solve it too. Basically just whichever direction you're going if you're going up always force the throttle full speed the way up the hill you're going. The continuous one, you can push the pedal partially down or partially up. I don't think that really helps. I think you pretty much need to floor it to, to make it up that up the hill. This one's just trying to balance. So you've got this pull. I mean, think of it like if you took a, a meter rod or a yardstick and you, you try to balance it on top of your hand and now walk across the room and have that not fall off. That's basically what it's trying to do. So let's go back here to the notes for this section, for this part in Google Colab, in GitHub actually. Now we're opening it in Colab, so it's opened here. Let's look at how to actually make use of AI Gem. I've got some basic information here, but the first thing we're going to do is we're going to import AI Gem. And each of those games that I showed you is basically called an environment. And this function that I just defined here essentially queries an environment. So you need to open up the environment and then you need to open up the specification for that environment. What I'm doing here is you can run this for each of the environments that we're going to be dealing with. And I'll show you it for a couple of Atari games as well. If you run it for Mountain Car, it tells you the action space. The action space of this type is discrete. So that means you can be doing three discrete things to run that mountain car. You can be going backwards, you can be applying the brakes. I think you're applying the brakes, it might be running idle, I, I forget exactly. And you can be going forward. I'll tell you on dealing with just about any of these environments, I usually look at the source code in GitHub for that environment to really truly understand how they work. Now the observation space, so you've got the action space. These are the things that you can do. And then the observation space is basically how the world has changed. Now there's two box values. Box basically means continuous. So there's two continuous variables that come back. And those two are basically telling you the location of that car, left and right. So how far up the, the, up the hill essentially is it and, and which side. So it's, it's essentially the X on that, sc that screen that was on. And then the other value is how fast is it going? And that's a plus or a minus depending on which, which direction it is moving it. And that's the whole universe. Those are the only two values that it needs. Max episode steps. So each episode is a play of this game. And that's how long the episode is going to last. If the car has not figured it out by 200 steps, we give up. Think of a step like a frame. Think of you're playing a video game. You know a video game, your, your render engine is shooting for maybe 30 frames a second, which is what a movie is. Each of those steps is a frame. So it's going to go for a max of, of 200 of those. Non-deterministic. I don't really like the naming of this one in particular. Most of these episodes or environments are random somewhat. So your cart, it's not like the physics calculation on that cart is completely predictable. Now you can seed it and you can put a seed into here and that's what the non-deterministic means. If you seed it, then that means it will be deterministic. But if you don't see it, it's it's somewhat random. So that is essentially what this means. Uh, most of the environments that I've worked with are non-deterministic. So if you seed them, then they're going to be the same. So this is important to understand. If you've trained a neural network to play mountain cart and you have it play it with a different seed, it might lose because it's, it's facing random situations. It's learned some basic ideas about how to, how to play the game. But if you, I don't know, if you look at the world's best race car driver, there's no guarantee that they're going to, they're going to win every time because there's a lot of random and random are just things outside of their control, outside of each game and, and they, they may not win. It's the same thing. Now for each of those steps, you're going to get a reward. So you essentially give it the action, it gives you back the observation. So what does the world now look like for the next step? And then you give it another action and it tells you what the world looks like. The reward threshold is essentially, that's what that's that's your basic reward. So if you get the negative 110, you didn't do so good. Now, mountain car is very stingy on rewards. You only get a reward when you win. 
which makes it a little difficult to train for because it's, I mean, imagine if you had to build this building and you don't get any feedback at each step. You build the entire building and they tell you if it was good at the end. That's very frustrating. But the neural network can actually optimize something that does win mountain car. And we'll see an example of that in the, in the next class. Now, I can also query the environment for cart pull. So that's the one where you're trying to balance the pull on a cart. The accident space for this one is discrete, so you can't stop. You are moving in one direction or another. And your observation space is for values. I had to go look at the code to figure out what those are. But essentially it's the cart position. You're moving the cart only in two dimensions. The cart velocity, how fast is it going? Because as you apply greater force from those two discrete directions, you accelerate. What is the angle of the pole? And what is the pole velocity at tip? So that's kind of the physics. Usually you think of the velocity of a pendulum or a pendulum. I mean, it's, it's essentially an inverted pendulum. And what is the velocity at, at the tip of that? And you can push the car to the left or the right. So the only two of these values that we're dealing with are discrete, meaning there's only two, so it's one variable, two possible settings, or continuous, which is box. So there's four continuous values. And if you're dealing with the mountain car continuous variety, they're both boxes. So the action space is just the accelerator. You can give it positive or negative acceleration in a continuous range or zero, meaning nothing. The maximum episode steps for some reason is 999, and it's it's a double negative, non-deterministic, so it is not deterministic. So, And then the reward range can go from negative to um to positive and the reward threshold is 90. Don't worry about this warning. I think that's a bug actually in OpenAI Gem. OpenAI Gem is is not maintained a lot. There's a lot of issues posted on it, but it's 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 a great toolkit still to use for this. Now Breakout. This is an Atari game, and I want to show you what they do for some of these Atari games, which is just kind of fascinating. So the observation space is it's essentially an image, 210 by 160 by 3. So that's that's essentially a red, green, blue image. And what you're doing here is using the image. So what is the user looking at? It's looking at the screen just like a user. That is cool, that it is just looking at that image and learning how to play the game. Episode steps can go on for quite a while. You can have 10,000 of them. Non-deterministic is almost always false on these. And the reward range can be anything. Reward threshold, they don't even give you one. Typically, I don't use the, the range and the threshold. They're kind of FYIs. Now, this, I think, is really fascinating. They also give you breakout RAM. You're looking at the RAM of the Atari 2600. The Atari 2600 has 128 bytes of RAM. Bytes, not K, not meg, and certainly not gig. So this is not that much memory. I mean, heck, the, the image size is bigger than the RAM that it took for that game. I mean, one row is 210 times three bytes. So that, that's, that's a lot of, that's uh, not a lot of memory. But by looking at the memory for this game, you can kind of tell what's going on. And who? what are those 128 bytes for? In the old school, they called that a memory map. And who knows? Only the Atari developers know. They're probably not even using all 128 of them. And just by looking at the memory manipulate as... As you play the game, you're able to, to play the game. Now, both of these, the action space, so the input is four. That's your joystick, your four positions, up, down, left, right. Because you're moving that little square around trying to, to bat the ball. And you don't need to give a, a bat the ball command. Just the fact that it hits your, your player causes it to, to bounce out. And what's fascinating, and we'll see how to do this, we, we develop a agent that is able to learn to play these Atari games. This I also want to show you because we're doing collab. If you were running this on your actual local computer, what would happen when you try to render and play these games is a window would pop up and you would actually see the Atari game. So if you want to, to actually play the Atari game on your computer in collab, since collab's a virtual environment, I'll show you how you can do this. So we're going to run this part here that does a pip install. We're installing Python Virtual Display, which is great for something like collab. I use it also to generate some of the videos that I attach in to show you kind of things playing. It gives you a Python virtual environment and it essentially is going to render it to a file that we can then turn into a video. 
Let's go ahead and run these. So essentially you're going to have it play the Atari game and record a video of it playing and you can potentially download the video or just watch it, watch it in collab. So you don't get to watch it play in real time. You kind of see it after the fact, but that's just as good. And it's all you can really do in collab. Now this part here, and I do provide a link because I got these functions from a very handy write-up that somebody did on how to use this in collab. So I'm going to run these just to find it. That shows the video and sets it up for you. We're going to play Atlantis, Atlantis version zero. So I'm going to go ahead and run this. What's basically going on here is while true, it's not using any AI at all. It's essentially doing a, it's sampling from the action space so it's basically taking random acts and look there's the game this is not playing in real time this is a video that had been recorded briefly while that cell was running but now you can watch it play over and over again it's about a minute and 16 you can see the players getting beat badly you've got a gun here you've got a gun and you've got a gun and it is shooting some of the some of the spaceships but the spaceships start to eventually take it out as as we play for further and further. The idea here is, gotta love 1980s graphics. Uh, this is an underwater city, this is water, and oops, just tuck out the main cannon so it's uh, as you lose your lives. But this is just an overview of AI Gem. We'll be using it more in the next two, really every, every module in this, every part of this module. Thank you for watching this video, and if you're interested in more things about reinforcement learning and training it for games, please subscribe to my YouTube channel. Thank you very much.